It's everything from red rock deserts to high mountain peaks to old growth forests to parts of the California coast. We'll celebrate 245 million acres of wildlife, wilderness, and possibilities on our public lands. We're going into the quail's living room. Everything that we do for our quail benefits all our, our wildlife here on the plantation. From forest thinning to prescribed burning, bobwhite quail are getting a helping hand with their habitat. And you have never seen New Mexico like this. Wilderness is more important in the 21st century than ever before. When you get a black swallowtail. The proboscis begins to form in the pupa. How could a butterfly help with brain surgery? We'll probe the secrets of the proboscis. Hope you're as fired up as we are for a brand new season of This American Land. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Turner Foundation. Hello and welcome to a new season of This American Land. I'm your host, Ed Arnett, and it's great to be back with you. We've got some terrific stories about the conservation of America's natural resources, our landscapes, waters, wildlife, and the people that are dedicated to conservation across the country. Today we start off with a look at the U.S. Bureau of Land Management, the BLM, an agency in the Department of Interior that's responsible for managing millions of acres of our public lands. Its policies have a critical impact on our natural resources, and the agency has evolved, and is still evolving, into one far different from when it began. My wife Carol and I love to hike here in Beaver Creek on the wild south slope of Pikes Peak in central Colorado. My name is John Stansfield. I'm a writer and an outdoorsman. Across the West, there are many areas like Beaver Creek that have lots of wilderness quality. They're administered by the Bureau of Land Management. The Bureau of Land Management is an agency in the Department of the Interior. They manage 245 million acres of public lands, along with all of the resources that go along with that, the wildlife, the wilderness, minerals. My name is Ann Morgan, and I'm a public lands consultant. It's everything from red rock deserts to high mountain peaks to old growth forests to parts of the California coast. Originally, the intent was to dispose of these lands and to develop them for oil, gas, mining, and to use them for their rangeland resources. And only really in the 1970s did that all change. My name is Ken Rate, and I'm a director of the U.S. Public Lands Program at the Pew Charitable Trusts. The evolution is in response to the public's um, love of these resources. Uh, the more people that are recreating on public lands, that are hunting and fishing and camping, the more the BLM's going to pay attention to the people who are recreating on the public lands. The culture of the BLM, I would say, is a little bit like a roller coaster. We like to joke a lot of times that the BLM is sometimes known as the Bureau of Livestock and Mining. But really, that does reflect, I think, how the BLM saw itself for the early part of its history. And I think that is changing. My name is Mark Squalacci. I am professor of law at the University of Colorado Law School. There are as many different opinions on what constitutes multiple use and sustained yield as there are people out there to tell you about them. And so from mining companies' perspective, it means one thing. For the person who wants to hike in the quiet and solitude, it means something else. And when the two come together, it's not usually pretty. The challenge for BLM managers is bring people around a table and have them start talking about what they have in common, not what they don't like about each other. My name is Elena Daly, and I am currently retired from the Bureau of Land Management. The Bureau's attitude is much more one of a team working together. And if you're going to do a project, you bring in the wildlife biologist and the archaeologist and the hydrologist and make sure that you're looking at a piece of land for all it contains. Using it doesn't necessarily mean abusing it. If I had to point to one 
particular thing that really changed the BLM. It was the establishment of the National Landscape Conservation System. This was a program that was put into place by then Secretary of the Interior, Bruce Babbitt. And it was really a remarkable idea. We decided there really was time to establish a conservation mission within the Bureau of Land Management. Public involvement is absolutely critical because without it, the agency is only going to hear from the development interest. They're not going to understand the human experience on these lands. And the human experience is the times that we're out there hiking, the times that we're out there just to enjoy the, the solitude, the, the incredible vast open spaces, the, you know, the deafening quiet. To be clear, we don't oppose all development on the public lands. There can be oil and gas development, that there can be mining, and there can be livestock grazing and responsible off-road vehicle use. 250 million acres is a vast domain. There's enough room for everyone. Some landscapes, it's going to make perfect sense to allow oil and gas development. Other landscapes may have some important recreational or wildlife resources, including things like endangered species or important cultural sites that should be protected. Those of us who live here in the West are really fortunate to be able to enjoy these lands whenever we wish. But we have to remember that these lands are part of our public land heritage. These lands belong to all Americans. In 50 years, I would hope that the American public would look back on the Bureau of Land Management and what it's accomplished with a sense of pride and a sense of gratitude and would be able to say, we gave this organization these lands and they managed them well and they managed them intelligently so that we know they will be there for generations. We are grateful for the acts of preservation and conservation that they have provided. In America, we are so blessed with our public lands. You don't have to be wealthy to go out and go camping or horseback riding or hiking in some of the most beautiful places in the entire world. Where in other parts of the world, um, that's all privately owned. You have to be a king or a friend of the king in order to enjoy that. Um, we're all royalty in the United States because these lands are available to all of us. And it is an incredible, world treasure. The bobwhite quail was once common in many parts of the country, but the introduction of exotic vegetation and the mismanagement of croplands and woody savannas have taken a toll on the bird's native grassland habitat, and its numbers are declining in many areas. The National Bob White Conservation Initiative is working in 25 states to restore and protect landscapes shared by Bob Whites and other wildlife. And we've sent our crews across America to find out what's being done. We went first to South Carolina, where both public and private efforts are underway to restore this iconic bird through the restoration and management of the pine savanna ecosystem that once blanketed hundreds of millions of acres. Trees got plenty of room, plenty of sunlight, plenty of good quail food, plenty of good brood cover. The quail uh, are not the most mobile animals. They, they're, they're small. Uh, they don't fly great distances. They can fly very fast, but not for very far. And, and most of their movement is on the ground. And they, they need to have all of their habitat needs uh, met within a small area. Harvesting, prescribed burning are probably the two most impactful things that you can do to a piece of property to enhance it for a suite of wildlife species, not only game species that a lot of our hunters are interested in, wild turkeys and bobwhite quail and white-tailed deer, but also a whole range of other species, grassland songbirds, Henslow sparrows, Bogman sparrows, uh, tree cavity nesting birds, red cockaded woodpeckers, pileated woodpeckers, some things that, that a lot of folks don't think about. And there really are some misconceptions out there about the use of active forest management to 
to create good wildlife habitat, that some folks have a hard time distinguishing between what's a destructive wildfire and what's a beneficial fire. The fire has just passed through, and you can see that it's browned up the lower needles. You can see green needles there. The bud is perfectly fine, perfectly healthy. My name is Gary Berger. I'm the statewide forester with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. This property's been owned by the state of South Carolina since 1941, but prior to that, it was a uh, southern shooting plantation, quail hunting preserve of sorts, gun club. If it wasn't for people wanting to hunt these birds and enjoy the sport of quail hunting and watching the dogs work and being out in the woods, uh, you probably wouldn't have a lot of this habitat. Good for pollinators as well, which is a big issue these days. See all the bees buzzing around it. Burning and thinning, that's, uh, that's the key. This was just burned two weeks ago. What we got here was an accomplishment. Our objectives to kill some of this understory of young pine. There's a history behind bobwhite quail and, and the hunting heritage that we have with quail. Years ago, quail was not managed. It was just a function of the habitat, the farming community. The dad could take a son or a daughter out of the back door and walk hedgerows and fence rows and find quail. And today, we don't have that because the landscape has changed. I am Steve Chapman, and I am the forestry coordinator for the National Bobwhite Conservation Initiative. My mission is to work with forest landowners, state, federal, private, non-government organizations that have timberland and manage that to help them in promoting their habitats for, for quail management and other associated species. Um, my name is April Atkinson. I'm a natural resources technician and I work at the Webb Wildlife Center. The Civil War is really what changed a lot of the land use practices. You had previous plantation owners, you had freed black men and whites who had to have a way of life. A lot of sharecropping started and tenant farming. That was really the best thing that happened to quail. Um, it was dirty farming, it was brushy. Quail thrived in this type of habitat. The farming and the quail worked together. Your locals would hunt quail. They would hunt it with a gun and a dog and go out. They're no different than a baseball player or a football player. They are, they're athletes. All these dogs, they want to come out here and do this. They love to do it just as much as we do. She is pointing, and that is our cue that they have found the birds. We're going into the quail's living room. It's, as we're riding through, we see a constant diversity. So here's your partridge pea here. Here's your ragweed plant here. Very lush and green, and it so this time of year draws insects. There's a quail right there. That is the bobwhite quail. That is the male. I'm Stuart Atkinson, the manager of Groton Plantation. Groton Plantation was uh, once a cotton plantation. It's because you've got to imagine the, the quail here on the ground when they when they bring their brood out and they're walking through, bugging through. I've got all these open these open areas. I want a, a, a closed canopy so that they can be underneath, and you're, so it's a um, lot harder for the predators to uh, to pick them off. a pretty standard example of a fourth row pine plantation thinning here where the operator is actually selecting to remove every fourth row but in terms of wildlife management it's one of the best things that we can actually do is to remove poor trees thin the forest canopy so light gets down to the forest floor and then use our other tools as such as mechanical methods uh, herbicide methods, prescribed burning to manage that understory layer, which is really the more important layer for a lot of the wildlife species. Sometimes just prescribed burning may not be enough, so we need to use chemical or mechanical means. The disking in the fields is a little bit different, and just that soil disturbance triggers germination of beneficial natural plants. We have to have the science and the research to basically prove that what we're trying to accomplish is actually where we're going with all this stuff, particularly with private landowners. To have an aesthetic, pleasing, open forest stand that now has a whole suite of wildlife species in it that you can see and hear and, and interact with, that, that's very gratifying. You need people who are passionate about wildlife, habitat, to actually save this type of ecosystems, manage it provide 
areas like this for the public. From the southeast, we now head west to northern New Mexico, where local people are campaigning for the expansion of the mountainous Pecos wilderness and the protection of a major watershed that's essential for farmers, ranchers, and communities downriver in New Mexico and Texas. Flying over the gorge and the mountains of New Mexico is so dramatic and beautiful. It's kind of breathtaking, actually. There's just an expanse of space in all directions. And once you're up there, you don't feel limited by any roads or fences or property lines. It just stretches on in one expanse of beauty. With my photography, what I really look for is a sight that moves me, something that makes me say, wow, that is amazing. And it's moved something inside of me. And when that happens, I know that I'm looking at something that needs to be captured and shared with the world. The Pecos Wilderness is an area in north central New Mexico that was created under the 1964 Wilderness Act. It is a major watershed for New Mexico, southern New Mexico, and southern Texas. 30 million people come into New Mexico each year that generate about $8 billion in annual business sales and creates more than 80,000 jobs for New Mexicans. There's several roadless areas that are on the boundaries of the Pecos. These have the characteristics of wilderness in them. There's an act of Congress that needs to take place in order to protect these landscapes as true wilderness. These lands are inventoried roadless lands because they are prime watersheds. They were created to protect the watersheds and the wildlife and recreation. We are proposing the special management areas to recognize existing recreational use, such as mountain biking, which is not allowed in wilderness, but would be allowed in the special management areas. Pecos wilderness means freedom. And I enjoy riding my mountain bike here in the Santa Fe National Forest on these roads. There are thousands of miles of these roads that I can ride on. It's OK with me that the wilderness areas are kept pristine for the wildlife and the watersheds. I've still got plenty of miles to ride on, and I can hike in those wilderness areas. So that's fine by me. I'm the sixth generation here in, uh, in San Miguel County. And our family has used this land for wood, fishing, hunting, and we're a part of it. It's very special to us. I'm pretty sure that at the county level, we have a consensus to protect the Pecos Wilderness and to protect our water and to protect our land, particularly the watershed. The water is our most precious asset here. We don't have very much of it. So it's incumbent upon us to make sure that this wilderness is protected. If we are able to incorporate the roadless areas into the Pecos Wilderness, we will have 150,000 protected acres that provide us with fresh water, fresh air, up to five counties here in northern New Mexico. We've been here over 700 years, and the Pecos Wilderness was easy access to the plains for buffalo hunts. There's times when we migrate into the Pecos Wilderness to gather herbs, to visit the springs, to hunt big horns, to gather what Mother Earth have provided for us so we could make that livelihood and fulfill that spiritual cycle. We have to protect it because that's where our livelihood begins. It's so important to me that I've spent a lot of time knocking on business doors, asking people to support it because I just think that right now is a critical time to really recognize the importance of nature and wilderness. We've seen elk coming out of the woods in the winter with um, their, the breath of the elk and the frost on their muzzles. And that was awesome and amazing. There's not many places that you can go in the country that you can call this land yours. You know, we're stewards of this land. It belongs to all of us. And if we don't protect these waterways, we're gonna be in big trouble. 
for instance, look at what happened to the Molly mine up in Cuesta. Yeah, it was a great economics for, for the community, but now it's no longer, but the scars are there. We're not asking for the whole world. You know, it's just a little, it's a, just a little section and we can keep this pristine forever. My favorite part of the landscape in the Pecos wilderness is the Truchas Peaks. They rise to over 13,000 feet, jagged on all sides, and just majestic as anything there is in New Mexico. We have a very diverse coalition, all of them supporting the idea that wilderness is more important in the 21st century than ever before. We have 2% of New Mexico, which is wilderness, and that 2% is the smallest in the entire West. Our coalition also includes Acequia Parciantes. These are irrigation canals that feed our traditional farmers. These traditional communities depend on the watershed from the Pecos wilderness. It feeds their croplands, their livestock, and their crops down below in the valleys. If we can get these landscapes these roadless areas into true wilderness, it would take that off the table for any future development. For me, the Pickles Wilderness is a church. It's a sanctuary. It is God's country, and we just need to take care of it. We're the stewards of the land. Time now for a little bio-inspiration. When it comes to engineering and design, it's hard to top the elegance of Mother Nature. Butterflies have an organ they use to sip nectar. It may look simple, but scientists are eager to imitate it. More now from Miles O'Brien in our Science Nation report. Looks like a drinking straw, right? But the butterfly and moth proboscis, or mouse structure, is no simple sipper. And for material scientist Kostya Kornev, it's nothing short of a bio-inspiration. In a single fiber, you have everything. You have sensors, you have transport system, so the material can be, and the liquids can be moved uh, through that fiber, okay? And the fiber performance is incredible. With support from the National Science Foundation, Kornev and a team at Clemson University want to know more about how the proboscis works in order to make synthetic fibers with similar properties. So the butterfly can coil and coil proboscis million, million times during adult life. Eventually, they want to build a proboscis-like microsiphon or probe. Using capillary action through channels and pores, it would suck up or dispense tiny drops of fluid. Such a device would have wide-ranging applications, like new medical tools. So you can think about even poking the single cell, taking a little droplet from, say, the nucleus, or if you can uh, go to the brain and uh, do the surgery on the brain. When you get a black swallowtail. For butterfly and moth expertise, he turned to entomologist Peter Adler. They want to better understand how the proboscis develops. The proboscis begins to form in the pupa. The insect has to transform from a caterpillar, which has no proboscis, it has uh, very uh, hard mandibles. So it has to transform to a butterfly that essentially loses its mandibles and instead, from other structures, forms this long tube-like proboscis. Kornev and his team do tests in their lab to understand the proboscis properties. They found it works both like a straw and a sponge, and its surface properties make it self-cleaning. No sticky residue can gum up the works. It's actually made of two tubes that can come apart, but naturally come back together, so self-repairing. Now we are interested how that fiber is organized. Is it possible to break the fibers apart and then bring them together on their own? Can butterfly uh, do that? And it appears that it can. He says the challenge is to understand how the proboscis evolved in butterflies and moths over millions of years, then recreate that structure and performance in a man-made fiber. 
if you would be able to produce the fibers on demand, just a little piece of uh, material which could uh, have all the sensors, uh, all these uh, mechanical devices, uh, all these probing devices in one unit, that would be terrific. Kornev is confident they will figure it out. With hard work, even challenging goals can take flight. Miles O'Brien reporting. Now, here's a quick look at a story from our next show. The Chenier Plain is, is one of the most globally significant ecoregions that we have really in all of the Western Hemisphere. What are some of the major threats to this system? Sea level rise, saltwater intrusion. Millions of birds uh, migrate to this area in the wintertime. It's very important we maintain what we have. And the first step is to protect our coastline. Within this five million acre landscape, um, really lives and livelihoods are dependent upon a healthy coast. Doesn't get any prettier than that. These headwater streams directly supply like 350,000 people in this area with their drinking water. Do you want to try to do protect it? That's all for now. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org and like us on Facebook. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Turner Foundation. <laughs>